There we go. Okay, thank you very much. There we go. Great. Well, thank you. So, Pam, you've given me the big head now. I feel like really important. <laughs> what is that? Um, yes, I've taken the level one and two MEPSOT native landscape certification program classes. And gosh, if you have not taken those, they are amazing. Um, I uh, serve on sort of a subcommittee of the level four, which is helping develop a class on advocacy. And we're in the infant stages of that, but I'm super excited about it. So I am thrilled to be here. I really want to thank Nancy Huffman and Pam Leanhard and all the others who helped me do this for your awesome Kerrville chapter of NUPSOT. I love speaking to the true believers in NUPSOT. I find that uh, just very, very fulfilling. So I'm going to go ahead and go into presentation mode. And very quickly at the beginning of this talk, let me just say that um, you know it's called the what, why, and how of gardening for wildlife. And that kind of tells you the order in which I'll do things. We'll talk about what a wildscape is first and what pollinates within that. So sort of a subcategory of insects and other creatures. Then we're gonna talk about why it's important to do this kind of gardening. I think that's a really important conversation to have. You don't ask people to change things unless you tell them why. And then finally, I'm gonna give you just five simple, easy peasy, lemon squeezy tips on how to actually do this in your own home garden in a way that your neighbors will understand to be a garden and they won't rebel against and they'll embrace, but also that's 100% supportive for wildlife. At the beginning, let me also say that all the photos that you see that have no attribution in them are taken in my home wildlife habitat gardens in Houston. For example, this is a westward facing view of my front yard from last, uh, this would be summer, early fall, about summer. A rattlesnake master and so forth is coming up, I guess spring. And um, our house is under 1600 square feet and the front yard is proportional in size. And about 60% of the front yard is turned into wildlife habitat at this point, but in a way that my neighbors can understand to be garden. And as you go through, I'm gonna introduce you to some of the creatures in the garden and you will see the immense biodiversity that's happening in the middle of Houston, Texas in an urban wildlife habitat garden. And uh, this diversity can be yours and mine and everyone's. Um, if we build it, they will come. So let's go ahead and begin and let's start with the what and let's start first with an understanding of what a wildscape is. So unsurprisingly, a wildscape, which some people call a habitat garden or a wildlife habitat garden or a pollinator garden, is a garden that has the primary purpose of supporting wildlife. So let's unpack that for a minute and see what that means. This means primarily three things. Every choice that I make of plant, of design, and of maintenance technique has that goal that you see on your screen right now as first and foremost. Um, you, we have to think of a wildscape as a community of plants and insects. It's not just the plants. So gardens are not just the plants and not just for aesthetics. It is part of a community um, of wildlife and so flora and fauna, but one that translates what we see in the wild into something that can be understood as a garden. And uh, along those lines, I really like Rainier and West I, uh, idea of designed plant community. So a design plant community, again, is a garden that translates what we see in our native system. So the savanna in your area, for example, um, and the coastal prairie in my area, and translates it in a way that can be understood as a garden. So it is equally about critters as it is about community. And one of the reasons that I say this is, is that if we have a garden, like, for example, I would love to have the Katy Prairie in my front yard, like all of my front yard because I am into that, but my neighbors would not understand it. And I live in community. Each of us is an ambassador for native plant use. And therefore, if my garden looks untended instead of intended, it will not be embraced by the community. The rejoice and be glad moment is that a garden can both re-garden and support wildlife 100%. Okay, so we'll talk about ways at the end of this in the how portion on how to do that. Because a picture is worth a thousand words, I thought I would show you um, some examples from my area of the world in Houston and then also in Clear Lake, which is closer to the coast by about an hour. 
So the most important thing that I want you to understand about a wildscape is that it's not all or nothing. In fact, it's a sliding scale of traditional all the way to very natural and wild. I have friends like my friend Russ here, he and his family have a very traditional garden, which is I think like 75% or more plants native to our eco region of Texas. No one can mistake this for an urban garden. So you notice that it has a lot of geometrical shapes. You notice that it has pathways and hardscaping to separate the different beds. So this is an example of very traditional. Um, the next couple of examples are going to be sort of in the middle in different areas. This is a mix. Um, some of you may know Jaime Gonzalez. He was with the Katy Prairie Conservancy and now with the Texas Nature Conservancy here in Houston. This is his family's home farm. So what you see on the right hand side is it's something that he does every year. He calls it his family pocket prairie. And every year he plants a sort of a spiral of mounds of dirt with seeds. And he grows wildflowers in patterns in his yard. Again, it looks intended instead of untended. People come by and take photographs of it. They make detours to see it. In the backyard, what you see is some beds that are bordered and other beds that have what we call um, green edging to them. In other words, there is a sharp delineation between the plants in the garden bed and the lawn in between in such a way that the eye reads distinct beds. So this is what I would call sort of a mid-range example of a wildscape. Another one from the former home of um, Jerry and Susan down in Clear Lake. So this looks even a little more wild still. This was, I want to say they had over 100 something species of native plants. So it was the vast majority of their garden beds. And as you can see, for example, on the left and the bottom right, the content of the garden beds were very wild looking indeed, very natural. But the eye reads them as garden beds because of the thick stone borders. So one of the tricks of the trade is the more natural the contents of the bed, the more the chunkier and more distinct the borders to the bed should be. And then it reads as something in the middle. This is the most natural on this end of the, uh, of the scale. This is from a, a friend of mine, her former house in an area with no HOA or deed restrictions. Uh, I love this. This is to my taste, but it's not to everybody's taste. There actually were some architectural moments in here, a trellis, a pathway, but you just couldn't see them. Again, it's a sliding scale. And now I want to show you a few more images from my own gardens. So this is St. Joanne's Crossing Wildlife Habitat, the name that we gave our home gardens. I can answer questions about why we have that name afterwards if you want. Again, the content of the bed looks a little bit wilder and therefore I have pathways that are actually also swales and chunky borders and other examples too. So it is a sliding scale, remember that. So that's what a wildscape is. Now let's talk for a moment about what pollinates within a wild state. So the bottom line is that a pollinator is any animal that while feeding on the nectar or pollen of a flowering plant, transfers the pollen from the male component of that plant to its female component or to the female component of a plant in the same species, that's it. So that's a pollinator. So let's talk about some of our very common ones. And by the way, this is a participatory class and those who don't participate, in the to channel Tom Lehrer, have to stay after class and clean the erasers. And if you get that one, welcome to my world. So we're gonna talk first about bees. So bees have evolved to be very efficient pollinators by virtue of specialized hairs that the females, most females of most species have um, called scopa that are like little dust mops. They are actually descended from wasps and Dr. Jaw at UT calls them vegetarian wasps because the adults feed on nectar, maybe a little pollen, but their larvae, their babies, if you will, feed on, uh, on primarily pollen with a little nectar mix, mixed in. And so pollen sources become huge for the propagation of bees. Um, I want you to hold up your pinky finger and I want you to look at the flesh colored part of your pinky, uh, your fingernail on your pinky finger. And now I want you to look at this middle flower right in the middle of the screen. And because everyone's muted, I won't ask the class what it is, but this is Texas frog fruit or Phyla notiflora. Some people call it turkey tangle fruit. 
Um, it is small. It is about the size of the flesh area of your pinky fingernail. And this is a bee on top of it. This is only a few millimeters big. Um, to the eye, it actually looks like a gnat, but that is a bee. And it's not the smallest bee in North America. That's the uh, job of the fairy bee, which is only a couple millimeters at most. So some of them can be very, very small indeed. Now, hold up your thumb. And I want you to look at the space between the last knuckle on your thumb and the tip of your thumb. So that's the size of some of our carpenter bees. So this is our Eastern carpenter bee female. Um, this is a carpenter bee though a bit smaller and our bumblebees. So they can range greatly in size. Um, they also feed with a tongue. Some of them have longer or shorter tongues. Bear with me, there's a method to my madness. You will see why, how they feed and what sizes and shapes they are matter when we get to the how of gardening later. And they're quite diverse. Who knew that bees could be green and blue? Am I right? And orange and red and brown and yellow and black and all kinds of colors, white as well. So bees are quite diverse. And in North America, we have about 4,000 species and the honeybee is not one of them. It's a domesticated insect brought from Europe and elsewhere, brought here for the production of honey. In Texas, we have about 1,100, according to Dr. Jack Dow. So bees are hugely important pollinators. And of course, everyone knows, and by the way, again, these are all from my little gardens in Houston. Butterflies are also pollinators, though not quite as good as bees. And that's because butterflies, like moths and butterflies, feed with an organ called a proboscis, which tends to be longer, especially in the larger butterflies. And so when they land on a flower, it tends to be their, their feet and their uh, proboscis that touch as opposed to most of their body where they're actually collecting the pollen for their babies like bees do. Um, they can range in size from about the length, the wingspan of an adult hand, and that's the giant swallowtail. I think it's the largest butterfly wingspan in North America, all the way to teeny tiny little things that are about the size of the flesh part of your thumbnail. In our home gardens, uh, we got last year, we recorded our 51st species of butterfly. And by the way, butterflies proboscis, although it does have a channel in the middle, it does not primarily function like a straw. It functions like a sponge, which means that they don't drink from things like bird baths or little dishes. Instead, they touch their proboscis to nectar or to mud on the ground, for example, or even dung to get moisture. So moths, I have no, many, uh, no idea how many species we have at St. Julian's Crossing because I don't tend to be outside recording insects at night. Um, we do have quite a few diurnal or day feeding ones. Like butterflies, they're in the order Lepidoptera, which means scale wing. And that's because the wings are covered in and anything that looks like hair on their body is actually specialized scales and thus scale wing. They too feed with a proboscis. They tend to be a little bit fuzzier, but not always. Um, and they are also very important pollinators, especially at night. Now, this is what blew my mind when I was first learning about pollinators about six or seven years ago. So a lot more than butterflies, moths, and bees are pollinators. Remember, any animal that while feeding on nectar or pollen, transfers the pollen from the male part of a flower to the female part of that or another flower. So most adult flies, not all, some are predators, some are parasitoids, but most adult flies feed on nectar or pollen. And therefore they are pollinators. And although most are not as fuzzy as bees, they tend to be low to the ground um, with some exceptions. And so they tend to rub up against that pollen and transfer it when they feed. The other cool thing about flies, in addition to their being beautiful, is that some of them, like for example, this one on the right of the middle, this one on the top right, and this one on the bottom left, are actually in a family of flies called surfid flies or hover flies. Um, they've get, gotten that name because they tend to hover when they feed. So these are double banged for the buck, y'all. The adults are pollinators and fairly good at it too. But their larvae, not all hoverflies, but these in particular, some of them, their larvae are predaceous. And that means that their little larvae, um, when they hatch, will actually feed on your garden pests like scale, mealybugs, whiteflies, and aphids. So they are a huge part 
of keeping our gardens in balance without pesticides. And a single larva of one of these, depending on the species, can consume 200 to 400 aphids before it pupates. So rejoice and be glad if you have some of these flies in your garden. And now wasps. So I say wasps and most people are like, ugh, wasps. And that's kind of how I felt because they eat our butterfly caterpillars, don't they? And of course, as humans, we, we wanna protect our, our butterfly caterpillars. But I am now of the philosophy that the circle of life is more important and the system is more important. That's just my personal view on it. And even though these wasps eat those caterpillars of moths and butterflies, they also do a fantastic job at natural pest control. They are one of the reasons that my husband and I have used no pesticides in probably six years, not even natural ones. We don't need to because these take care of it. Most of the adult wasps are actually feeders of nectar and pollen. It's their babies that are predaceous, their larvae. And so the mamas will sting those insects, yes, caterpillars, but also your garden pests, and they will stock the larder for their babies and others will lay their eggs inside of them. And some of those wasps are very tiny indeed. These are new hatchlings, and this is a Gallardia pulchella or a blanket flower or firewheel leaf, or I mean petal. Look how tiny they are. I think they're also beautiful. So they're pollinators as well. And finally, what I like to call the four bees plus more, beetles, bugs, bats, and hummingbirds. So basically any animal that transfers that pollen while feeding. Okay, so now that we've talked a little bit about the what, oh, and by the way, wasps feed with the tongue just like bees do because they're related in an ev evolutionary way. Um, so let's talk about why we need wildscapes, um, focusing more broadly on all insects instead of just pollinating insects. So this is a great study that was um, issued about 15 years ago. It's cited by Dr. Doug Tallamy and his Bringing Nature Home and other sources. So this is great. And so what the authors decided to do, the researchers did, was they tried to give a dollar value to the eco services that native insects in the continental US brought to our economy each year. They concluded it was around $60 billion, but they said at the outset and at the conclusion, that is way low. And by the way, this excludes honeybees because there's a lot of data on those. So this is just our native insects and that number is low and that's annual. So of course, those insects that pollinate even beyond bees um, are hugely important for our food crops for humans. So about two thirds of our food crops require insect or animal pollination to propagate. And that translates to about a third of what we eat each day. And this is billions of dollars a year to our economy. Beyond human food crops, um, insects are a huge part of uh, pollination services for flowering plants and trees in general. So depending on the metric that you read, about 75 to 95% of flowering plants need some animal to pollinate it. And a large chunk of that is insects. And of course, the more plants we have, the better it is for our world and ecosystems, right? Because plants through their roots uh, prevent erosion. They also help with flood control and carbon sequestration. So for in our, um, in, your, in your savannas with your different grasses and forbs in particular, and here in our coastal prairies, the deeper the root of those forbs, those flowering non-woody plants and grasses, the more water and carbon they can sequester because they sequester below the ground in their roots. Trees, on the other hand, sequester carbon in their trunks. So plants are really good at that. And in the, the era of climate change, we need all the help we can get. Likewise, they're hugely important for the food chain. So let's just spend a moment and visit about this and sort of talk about it a bit. So first off, future uh, generations of pollinators need sources of pollen and nectar to feed on. And of course, we need pollinators to ensure propagation. Likewise, a lot of animals like our little, I think it's a chipmunk here, uh, other mammals, birds rely on seeds, nuts, berries, fruits. And a whole bunch of those require pollination, a large chunk of which is done through insects. Beyond that, insects are just really nutritious. Like they are not uniquely, but in large part, sort of that first level of, of fauna that eats plants and takes that, um, the energy that was, um, that was uh, through photosynthesis stored in the plant from, from sunlight and they take it and they convert it into things like protein and other nutrients. 
And so a lot of things eat insects and they're a, a key anchor to our food chain. And I want to spend just a moment talking about birds. So we've all heard the early bird gets the worm. But how many worms does that early bird need to feed their babies? And so this goes back to um, something Dr. Doug Tallamy talks about in some of his research and in Bringing Nature Home. I'll show you an image of that book later if you don't know it, it's fantastic. So it was either his study or another study about which he's spoken. It's been replicated since, I believe. Um, and so what they start with is they say, look, about 90, about uh, a quarter of adult birds diet is beyond nuts, grains, berries, seeds. And, we're, and they feed on insects. So about a quarter of adult birds feed on insects as a supplement or uniquely or whatever. But that's not true of their chicks. So juvenile birds, nestlings, about 96% of our terrestrial species can feed only on insects and other arthropods. They cannot digest berries, seeds, and nuts. So Talami talks about the study, or he did this study, I just can't remember it right now. Um, like, well, how many is that? And so they studied Carolina chickadees, I believe in the Northeast. And they found that a single mama chickadee with a single clutch in a single season required not dozens, not hundreds, but thousands of insects to feed a single clutch. And that's one mama. So if we don't garden in a way that invites in insects, we will have fewer baby birds or baby birds that starve, which is a very sad thing indeed with all the data coming in about how, how much in trouble <laughs> birds are from various sources. So I just sort of offer that to show how important insects are in the food web. It's just one example. There are also um, really important insects are in decomposition services. So for example, they recycle dung by feeding on it. They break down dead plant matter. They even uh, help decompose carrion. And when they die, insects themselves degrade and release things like, I think, nitrogens and other things into the soil. I have no idea why my soil is so rich here. I really just buy the like cheapest organic, no mix in soil and compost when I originally create my beds. And then I don't feed them anymore. I don't need to anymore. And I suspect it's because of the high number of insects and other animals that are drawn in that leave byproducts or else that die in the soil. That would be part of my guess. Uh, insects are also really, really good at taking care of their own, to paraphrase Dr. Talamy. So they're really good at pest control to the tune of over four and a half billion dollars a year. Um, this is parasitoids and predators. Um, and to paraphrase Talamy again, if you have a problem with too many insect pests, then you need more insects. <laughs> so we welcome them in and they take care of our pest control. So the thing is, and this is the why y'all, that insects are in a world of hurt right now. You can see on your screen, a lot of what scientists and researchers, so these are entomologists primarily, believe are some of the drivers, uh, the key drivers of insect decline, primarily things like um, habitat loss, fragmentation and degradation of the soil. Because you know where I live, was all coastal prairie, it was Savannah where y'all are, and humans have moved in and we're not going anywhere. So not only have we fragmented by moving in, we've actually removed some of that natural habitat and by planting non-natives that insects can't eat, we've actually deprived them of that. Um, parasites, disease, climate change, and so forth. And we could spend a week on this and I'm gonna spend 20 more seconds. Um, suffice it to say that the entomologists and researchers don't know all the parameters yet. They don't know how much each of these contributes. They don't have, certainly don't have all the data from around the world. Um, they are scratching the surface of it. But they are telling us right now, and by the way, anytime a researcher takes off their white lab coat, <laughs> comes out of the lab and says, I'm still researching this, but I can see the writing on the wall and it's bad, y'all. When they do that, like they're doing for insects, we need to listen because that's unusual. It's been described in January of this year as death by a thousand cuts. Serious declines in insects abundance, diversity and biomass worldwide. Again, we haven't explored all the nooks and crannies. We may not even know all the species of insects, surely we don't, but we know that they're in a world of hurt. 
And entomologists themselves are now calling for action at all levels, y'all, international, national, province, state, city, and individual. And I wanna give you just one glimpse into the thinking process of some entomologists. So this is from a couple of years ago, June of 2018, sorry, June of 2019. It was in um, Manga Bay News, which reports on the tropics and so forth. It was called The Great Insect Dying, a four-part series that's linked in the handout um, that was mentioned at the beginning of the talk. So it's online with your NEPSOT chapter website. So they interviewed 24 entomologists from 12 different countries of spread out over six continents. And they asked them one question on a scale of zero to 10, with zero being no problem at all, and 10 being extremely dire, how would you rate the insect abundant crisis? None of the 24 said below eight, and some of them said 10. And these are entomologists. So it's not good. And I give this talk all the time and there is literally no way to sugarcoat it. So I don't know about you, <laughs> but after that, <laughs> I could use a rejoice and be glad moment. So are you ready for the rejoice and be glad moment? Right here, right now, right in our own gardens. We are a critical link in the chain that will save insects and thus the ecosystem. Right here, right now, right at home. And we all know how a chain works. It is only as good as the integrity of each link in the chain. So I'm not gonna lie. We do not get a hall pass on doing things beyond our own garden at the individual level. We still must be engaged to the extent that we can in the international, national, state, and local like city and county level. We have to be engaged because a chain needs all of its links. But flip that coin, y'all. We, in our home gardens, are a critical link in that chain. I may have only indirect influence at the national or international level, for sure. But by God, I can control what goes into my garden. And I don't know about you, but I find that massively empowering. Like I used to look at those, that data on insects and be like, what am I gonna do? And then I realized, I'm gonna do stuff at home. And I see this y'all, like our civic duty of voting and doing charitable works and helping our community. If your neighbor's down on their luck, you help your neighbor. That's, what's, that's what citizens do. That's what community does, no different. And I don't know about you, but that and a cup of coffee gets me going in the morning, right? So it is in our hands. I love what Dr. Doug Tallamy says. This is from Bringing Nature Home. Now. For the first time in its history, gardening has taken on a role that transcends the needs of the gardener. Like it or not, gardeners have become important players in the management of our nation's wildlife. It is now within the power of individual gardeners to do something that we all dream of doing, to make a difference. I love that. And when we do these gardens, and by the way, I would say, it's less about the size of our garden than about the fact that we have a garden that uses the right plants, design, and techniques. Because when we do that, y'all, remember we talked about habitat fragmentation? When we change how we garden so that insects and other animals can use it, we create, in the words of some researchers, stepping stones or others, bio corridors that help reconnect our fragmented habitat while we still live here. It's a win, win, win. And Talamay calls that bringing a homegrown national park. So we are part of that solution. So these are the books that I've been mentioning before. Uh, the one, on, these are both by Dr. Doug Talamay, who's an entomologist who doesn't write like an entomologist. He writes beautifully, easy to read, easy to understand. On the left is written more than 10 years ago. On the right came out, um, I think in February or so of 2020. If I had to choose one, I would choose Nature's Best Hope because it is sort of an updated continuation of bringing nature home, but both are outstanding. 
Okay, so now let's talk about five simple steps to um, make our gardens inviting to insects and thus other wildlife. Before I begin, I wanna recommend three books that I have found extremely helpful. So on the left, I would say this is the most basic of the wildscaping type books. This is by Rick Dark, who's a landscaper in this kind of landscaping and Dr. Doug Tallamy again. So the two books I showed you from Dr. Tallamy before are the why, but not the how. This is the how. And so it's called The Living Landscape, really accessible, easy. If you're a pretty rudimentary gardener, like at the beginning, this was very helpful for me. To the right is um, Rainier and West. I talked about them early on. This is called Planting in a Post-Wild World. This is sort of an intermediate level. Um, I will say one thing about Rainier and West. They do not advocate for 100% plants native to your ecosystem. They say anything that grows well here is acceptable. I disagree with, it's not that I'm a hater of non-native plants. It's just that they personally, the, the research is starting to show that the more non-natives we have, maybe the fewer that our native insects can eat for reasons I'll talk about later. And so why not plant natives? But they, they do say, look, you get a lot of bang for the buck for wildlife with native plants and everything they talk about for design totally works with plants native to your area of Texas. So just understand that caveat about it, that it's got good design techniques. And this one's way above my pay grade. I'm still working my way through it after a year, right? It's called Garden Revolution by Wiener and Christopher. I love this book, extremely detailed uh, from ground zero. How do I even assess what's on my property? How do I know what's important? What does succession mean, right? Great books. Okay, if I could give you one tip, it would be this tip and that's support the home team. By this, I mean plant plants native to your eco region. You really want this to be eventually the majority of the plants in your garden for the reasons we'll talk about. Now, in a way, I'm kind of preaching to the choir, but in a way I'm not, because this presentation is gonna be available on the web to anybody. And also when I first started attending um, NIPSOT meetings here in Houston, in my area, in my, in my now chapter, one of my two chapters now, I didn't know anything about this. So I offer this here um, as a resource for sharing with others who are new to this. So uh, as some of you may know, there actually is kind of a debate about what a native plant is. And so I kind of like Dr. Calamy's way of understanding it. And that is a plant having historical evolutionary relationships with a particular localized wildlife community. And if you think about it, that has three aspects. The first is time, not hundreds of years, but thousands of years so that the plants have a chance to evolve, okay? And to evolve with other things. Place, they've been there <laughs> for thousands and thousands of years. In other words, um, this plant has evolved in an area with common uh, maybe soil type or water uh, you know, resources and other things like that. And finally, this idea of community, because to my mind, a uh, native plant means nothing in the abstract. You have to think about it as it has co-evolved with other plants and animals over those thousands of years in that locality. That's when a native plant becomes useful and superior. So um, as a general rule of thumb, we kind of wanna plant those plants that are native to our particular eco region. So I'm uh, in the, the Gulf Coast, so Gulf Coast prairies. Y'all are in the Edwards Plateau. I understand that savanna, um, a lot of it is grassland savanna, but not uniquely forbs and grasses. Uh, but one thing we do have in common are those forbs and grasses. And I'm guessing that your grasses like ours have very deep roots indeed, and some of your forbs as well. Um, though you may have different trees uh, and so forth from what we have. So, um, you can see how our counties don't quite line up with eco regions, right? Because counties are a human construct. But I'm gonna give you a little tip for when you go to a nursery, right? So let's say I go to a nursery and I see a section that says Texas native plant. But Texas is the size of France. <laughs> we have a lot of different eco regions and a lot of different conditions and, um, and so forth. And so, Sometimes nurseries are not always good about making our Texas native section <laughs> those that are only from our local area. So I always bring my pocket computer with me, my little cell phone, 
and I get on Google or some other search uh, engine and I, I do this. I type in the Latin name of the plant. It's more reliable than the common name. And then I type in USDA. And this will take me to the plant profile on USDA for that plant with an interactive map. And if I zoom in, I can see native status by county. That's one of two resources that's my go-to. And my rule of thumb is, until I win the lottery, I have some non-invasive, non-native plants that my critters love. It's about 10% of my garden now, but it started off as a whole bunch more. So I'm not gonna like rip them all up because I don't have the money or time for that. <laughs> but when something that's not native dies, I replace it with something that's native. So it's a gradual progression. So why do we want plants native to our eco region, those plants that have evolved in that area? And that's because as a general rule of thumb, they feed more critters. So according to, very, to a particular study, um, about 90% of our plant eating insects at some point in their development are going to be specialists in the way they feed. So what's a specialist? A specialist is an insect that can feed only on those plants in a particular family, genus, or even species. This is primarily true for leaf, but it can also be true for pollen. And by the way, about 25% in the eastern part of the continental US, about 25% of our native bee species, their babies, their larvae are specialists on particular, the pollen of those plants in a particular family, genus, or species. And a very large number of Lepidopteran caterpillars, so butterflies and moths, tend to be specialists. So an example is the monarch butterfly. We all know that as an adult, it can feed on the nectar of anything. But as a caterpillar, it can feed only on those plants pretty much in the genus uh, Asclepius, which is milkweed. And some are specialized even more below genus to species. So it's not that our insects that have evolved here in our area can never feed on plants, the leaf or pollen of plants from other areas of the world. Um, a good example of some that can are the black swallowtail. It's a specialist on those plants in the family, uh, the carrot family, um, when it's a caterpillar, but it feeds on things like Queen Anne's lace and, um, and rue, and uh, it also feeds on parsley and fennel and dill, and those are all from Europe or other parts of the world. It's just that not every animal is, insect is so lucky. And so the more native plants you have that they've co-evolved with, the more likely they are to be able to consume that leaf or pollen. They also tend to be hardier in our climate. So in, in my area of Texas and prairie, um, they're used to being nuked in the summer and drowned in the spring. Um, so that means that they have evolved to deal with drought and y'all have drought as well. Um, and so I spend less money replacing them. And if I choose drought tolerant plants, now there are some natives that like a lot of water and like wet feet, but if I don't choose those and I choose those um, prairie plants from my area, for example, that are used to drought, then I spend very little money on water. So in fact, I don't own a sprinkler. I spot water during high drought uh, in a few places. And there are some plants like Velaria pulchella and um, my Texas lantana and some others that I literally never water. So they're cheaper and they take less time to maintain. They can also save and purify water and prevent erosion. So I mentioned before that the deeper the root of a grass or a forb, which is a non-woody flowering plant, the more carbon and water it can sequester. So let's talk for a moment about that. Um, some of the prairie plants, and I'm not sure about um, the grassland savanna, but I imagine it's similar. Some of our plants have roots that are deeper than an adult human is tall, so they can go down to 12 to 14 feet. So all of that is sequestering carbon below ground, and it helps sort of direct water down as well during regular, uh, regular volume, volume rainstorms. And so that's really good. And they've evolved that way because fire is part of the prairie and so is grazing by bison and so forth. And so they store that in the root. It's really, really important. The other thing is that in 2018, I participated in a Katy Prairie um, Conservancy in Houston Audubon Society workshop. And someone there gave a statistic which I found astounding. So our St. Augustine lawn can sequester maybe half an inch of rainwater during a regular rainstorm per hour. But a full-on prairie 
Again, my garden's not an actual prairie. A full-on prairie can sequester inches of water per hour. So the more of those plants that I have in my garden, the more water it's gonna sequester and, and we need that in Houston. And so same for y'all in your grassland savanna. It's also okay if native plants get out. So here's the thing. I am not a hater of all non-native plants. What I'm concerned about, and um, uh, someone was talking about this in the meeting, um, I'm sure you're concerned as well about those non-native plants that are aggressive and that nothing here has evolved to eat. Things like Chinese tallow which is shown here on the screen. This is merely a seedling. Look at the length of that root. This tree alone is responsible for destroying some of the, I mean, it's seriously challenging some of the few fragments of prairie we have left. So that's the problem with aggressive non-native plants that get out that nothing here has evolved to eat. So even if it's aggressive, if it's native, it's always been here. So it's okay if it gets out. Second tip, pretty common sense, avoid pesticides. I highly recommend this book by Jessica Walliser. It reads super easy. My husband gave it to me for Christmas a couple years ago, really informative. What I really love is that she introduces you to the insect predators and parasitoids that keep your garden healthy naturally so that if you see them, you know what they are. She then suggests particular flowers and other plants that will attract the adults so that they can come in and lay eggs and their babies can eat your pests or the adults will eat your pests. Because remember, many predators supplement their diet with nectar and pollen or eat only nectar and pollen. And then she has garden design graphics. Fantastic book. So things go in cycles in our garden. Um, that's the key. So in order to understand how bio pest control works, we have to understand first that it requires human patience. This was the hardest thing for me. So I would see my milkweeds covered as in three of these photos here with those little yellow oleander aphids. Uh, they get all over it. The first thing I wanted to do was to squish them or to hose them off, but now I don't. I let them cover my plants for two weeks and during that time, they will exude a little honeydew that attracts those female hoverflies that lay their eggs and eventually become top left and top right, the larvae that can consume two to 400 aphids before they pupate depending on the species. So if I were to squish or wash off those aphids, I would be squishing or washing off the eggs of those predators. Likewise, this is a wasp laying her egg inside of a different species of aphid on my gara. So you'll have a couple of weeks with the pest and then a couple of weeks pest free and it will go in cycles. Tip three, mix it up. I like to call this variety is the spice of life. So why do I say variety is important in our garden? And this is the method to my madness. Do you remember when we introduced each other to those pollinators? They feed in different ways. Some have tongues, some have a proboscis. Flies have, some of them have shallow spongy mouth parts. They need to get really close to the nectar reward. Some are big and need a landing pad. Some are tiny and need things they can get inside, right? So because pollinators come in different shapes and sizes, our garden needs to have variety. Most importantly, we need to choose flowers of different sizes and colors. So some flowers with a big flower head that can serve as perches for my giant swallowtails and my monarchs, for example, that are big and need a landing pad, but then some that are small for my smaller critters. And color was interesting to me. I knew that humans and insects saw colors differently. I did not realize that insects saw color as differently as they do from each other. So for example, bees are particularly good at seeing yellow, white, and purple. So they're particularly attracted to those flowers, but they're not as good as at distinguishing red from green. In contrast, hummingbirds and butterflies are really good at seeing the reds. So do I have to memorize what colors different critters like? Nope, I just have a lot of different colors. And by the way, it's gorgeous to have a lot of different colors. I also want to choose flowers with different structures, so tubular, composite, and so on and so forth. Why? Because different 
body shapes and feeding requirements. I wanna particularly highlight composite flowers. If I were gonna go heavy on any structure for a flower in my garden, it would be, and it is, composite flowers. Because composite flowers, this center is not a single thing. It is actually dozens or even a hundred or so teeny mini flowers, little nectar and pollen rewards. So when a small critter in particular or any critter lands on it, it's like going to the shopping mall. It's one-stop shopping and they can sit there and feed and feed and feed and feed and feed. Um, instead of going to like driving around town for different things, right? And so composite flowers are particularly popular in my garden. And I would say among them, the Gallardia pulchella or Indian blanket or firewheel as it's also called, hugely popular. I think it's native to your area of Texas. It is throughout most. I also want to choose flowers that bloom in different seasons. This is pretty easy to fulfill when you go to the nursery, read the tag or hop onto the Lady Bird Johnson Wildlife uh, Center native plant database that they have and just look at the bloom times. And the reason I say this is, it's really easy to find plants that, that are blooming in the spring and the summer, but we tend to forget about the fall and the fall is hugely important. So just make sure that there are things blooming at different times in the garden. You also want to layer the plants in your bed and there are two reasons for this. So this is, again is from uh, spring of 20, 2020. So I have tall plants like ivy leaf thoroughwort, rattlesnake master, big blue stem that's gonna get like 12 feet tall. So they are anchoring the bed in the middle or at the back. Around them is Coniclinium coelestinum, blue mist flower, um, and a few other smaller things, maybe some Gallardia pulchella over here. And that middle sort of fills it in. And then at the bottom, I use native ground covers. So here I have a lot of Corpus Christi fleabane. I have um, wild violet petunia that volunteered in my garden. I have Texas frog fruit. So having those layers in a single bed with um, those tall plants being visual anchors at various focal points is important aesthetically because it helps your garden read garden, right? It helps the community understand that it's intended instead of untended. There's also a biological benefit, and that is that different critters need different heights of plants to shelter, for mating, for other protective things. So giving them multiple layers is hugely important. And finally, using native ground covers instead of mulch is something I am fully embracing now. It cuts down on my weeding time dramatically. This bed used to be filled with um, Bermuda grass and almost entirely it's been displaced by those plants that I mentioned. So a lot less weeding for me. Tip four, pile it up. So by this I mean plant in clusters by species. So you can see here I have Gallardia pulchella, I have American germander, I have Texas and rough coneflower, um, and I have you know my non-native purple coneflower but it's here and I love it and there we go. Um, blue mist flower here. So plant in clusters. Um, a good rule of thumb is to plant in odd numbered clusters. So like three, five, and seven. For some reason, the eye kind of likes that. So the aesthetic purpose is the more you cluster your plants in, in intentional groups, the more intentional the garden looks, right? And the more it, it falls on the traditional side as opposed to the natural side, just a, your choice. There's a biological function too. Um, and that reason is that, uh, so first off, butterflies flying overhead might be able to see the particular flowers they like better if they're in a cluster, but also some of our bees and other insects, primarily bees practice what we call flower constancy. Honeybees are a good example. And that is they like to forage on the flowers in a particular species first before they move to another species. So putting them in clusters allows them to do that very easily. You can also do combination patches. So I learned in um, the Native Landscape Certification Program Level 2 class about um, the color wheel for plants. And so complementary colors opposite on the color wheel brings energy. And so that's why I have seaside goldenrod and aromatic aster, which is hill country, not mine, but it's here. It's not invasive. Um, I have them together and it gives, um, it gives a lot of uh, interest and energy. So you can do that as well. And finally, the last tip, and then we'll open for Q&A, 
embrace imperfection. So remember I said, it's not just plant choice, not just garden design, but maintenance techniques. And this is part of that. So the first thing that we all want to do after a freeze is we wanna get that out there and cut down all those unsightly dead stems of our floors, right? We just wanna cut down all those things. And I invite you not to do that. And here's the reason. Remember how tiny some of those bees are? So about 30% of our native bees nest above ground um, and uh, not all of them, but some of the tiny ones will actually chew into pithy and hollow stems and make their nest there. And they might overwinter there as protection. Same with some of our native wasps. So if I cut down those stems and compost them, I might be composting, for lack of a better way to say it, baby bees. If you're going to cut them down, then leave a couple of feet sticking up so that they can be nesting material moving forward and pile the cut parts um, until probably late spring somewhere outside where they can still escape. I also tend to leave seed heads um, because birds and other critters will feed on them over the winter. I use fallen leaves as mulch when I'm not using green mulch of native ground covers. I do this instead of commercial mulch. If your HOA rules allow it, I recommend doing it. Um, about 70% of our native bee species and a whole bunch of our native wasp species nest underground. I mean, who knew that, right? So if I put down a thick layer, layer of commercial mulch, those mama bees and wasps probably can't get to the soil, but they can get through leaves. Um, leaves also provide cover for things like butterflies, small mammals, reptiles, amphibians, overwinter birds. And when they degrade, they feed the soil. A couple of caveats. Um, I would not shred the leaves if my HOA uh, allows me not to shred them because some Lepidopteran species, especially moths, but some butterflies actually pupate attached to leaves of deciduous plants. And when those leaves fall and turn brown, the chrysalis or pupa is still there. Um, so if you shred them, you might shred those. And I would also make sure that you don't choose the leaves of a plant that have chemicals that suppress the growth of other plants. That's a little evolutionary trick that things like magnolias have. So don't use magnolia leaves, for example. And if you use neighbor's leaves, make sure they don't use pesticides or herbicides. And last tip, and then we'll wrap it up for questions. Let your early spring wildflowers go. Um, very early in the spring, in January and February, sometimes this is all they have to eat. Here's a little trick if you want it to look intentional. So what I did here was I took our push mower and I mowed around, but I left chunks of our wildflowers and I just put bricks around it to make it look like it was actually a garden bed. And people actually were walking by there like they had no idea that it was just wildflowers. So that my friends is that. Um, I'm happy to open up to questions. I hope it was helpful. I hope you enjoyed it. Yes, thank you very much, Lauren. Very informative. And you know, all of those things work for our area too, all of the concepts, not necessarily all the specific plants, but all the concepts and what to do. Definitely. So I'm gonna look in the chat and see what we oh. have. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, do we have questions right now? I'm seeing thank you for such a well-planned, focused, organized and on point message. Mm -hmm. Glad y'all enjoyed it. Elaine, do you have a question? Yes. <laughs> I was wondering, I, with all the rain we've had this year, all my flowers and have been growing like crazy, but they're not flowering. And it, without flowers, it's not helping pollinators much. So what do I do to get them to, to flower? So what plants do you have, Elaine? Oh my goodness. Well, I've got different kinds of salvias. I've got lantanas. I've got, um, oh my. well, I have a lot of um, this, the salvia that grows in the shade. It's like scarlet sage, salvia, coccinia, the red one. And right. there's blue, there's blue too, that grows well in shade. Right. And uh, I mean, they're just, they're just uh, coming up all over everywhere. <laughs> and um, no, that's not the, there's something else. I, anyway, I don't remember all of them. I got them all at the, the native plant sales. So uh, I just wondered that, I mean, they're just sitting. I've even tried cutting back some. Oh, and, and my Esperanza 
last year was the first time it's bloomed and I just whacked the heck out of it because I was mad at it for not blooming and it started <laughs> blooming after I cut it way back. So it really, I, my in my experience, it can really vary widely why something doesn't bloom. And sometimes I just don't know why it doesn't. Um, Sometimes when I have, so I, like I told you, I choose a lot of drought tolerant plants and I make sure that my soil is, like I mix in a little sand with my soil sometimes so that, um, so that I make sure that it's well drained. But that said, uh, sometimes when we have a whole bunch of rain like we did this year, it stresses out my, like my fire wheel, my Gallardia pulchella. Mm -hmm. uh, when I had Texas lantana, I don't have it right now, but when I had it, sometimes when it got too much rain, it would stress it out. And so the leaves would turn yellow and I would have issues with some of the blooms. Do you know what I mean? Um, they would be kind of sickly. And so it may be that there's something, I, I don't know. Again, it's very specific. And I think someone would have to look and see what's going on. Sometimes it can be that the conditions are either too dry or too wet. That's just my personal experience, not as a horticultural expert or anything. Um, the other thing is that some plants that can go from like part shade to full sun, I found actually bloom more profusely in full sun. So for example, in my area, we have blue mist flower. Um, Y'all may have Greg's mist flower out there, but blue, um, it can grow in part shade, but it doesn't bloom a lot. Um, whereas if it's out in part sun to full sun, it blooms a whole bunch. It just needs a bit more water. So the, some of the salvias you're talking about actually should be blooming like um, blue sage and scarlet sage, if those are, native in your area. So I'm, I'm not sure what that might be. Maybe it's a soil thing. Maybe it's just, um, maybe they're just too young. Some plants take a couple of years to start blooming. These are pretty old. I've been in the house for four years and they were already here when I moved in. So, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I wish I could be more helpful on that, but it could be, it could be various things. Should I try to fertilize them with a natural fertilizer? I mean, you could try, but I would see if you could find someone to diagnose it first. Oh, okay. Uh, we have a question, Lauren, from Penny about controlling, um, is it Johnson grass? Controlling Johnson uh, grass? Do you have any suggestions? Uh, <laughs> I wish I had an answer on that. Um, I, you know, I, I've been, okay, I'm going to say I've been fortunate and not had it in my yard, and now I'm going to have it in my yard. <laughs> Um, I have Bermuda grass um, and a few other things that I just hate and I just can't get rid of. But um, but there are ways that I have sort of squeezed them out. I don't know if it would work for Johnson grass. Um, what I have done is that sort of that green mulch technique. So like I said, I had a whole bed infested with Bermuda grass. You know how hard that is to get out. And if you pull it out, it actually comes back more vigorously. It's just the worst. Um, so... I actually started planting in those other things. And then here's the trick with green mulch technique. You get in an aggressive native ground cover, you plant in plugs of it, or you can also throw down seeds. When the thing you don't want comes up, let's say Johnson grass, Bermuda grass, instead of yanking it, you clip it at the base of the plant. The root is still under the ground, but if you pull it out, you actually stir up those seeds of that annoying plant and others that are in the soil and will actually germinate more of it. So you cut it back so that your native ground covers have the advantage. It's all about giving them the advantage. And eventually they will take over that whole bed. Now it's not like you will never have. Um, again, I'm guessing Johnson grass would respond similarly. I don't know in my personal experience, but I know Bermuda grass, I still get some, but it is not taking over the whole bed anymore because it's out competed. And then again, when I get it, I snip it at the base. So that's one technique that you can try, but I would suggest going to the ag extension, um, near, you know, an ag extension website and seeing what their recommendation is for Johnson grass. That one is a, a huge problem. I have a question if I may. Uh, I had a friend in Kingwood who lived under HOA requirements and, and she tried growing native plants and the HOA would put letters in her mailbox telling her to cut her weeds. Uh, I've also heard on the other hand that HOAs really can't make you stop. Um, so, so what is the truth? You're, I mean, you're, you're uh, yeah. not with this. What, what is the real story here? So there actually is a statute. It's in the Texas property code. I forget the number, 
and it was enacted after, do you remember after Hurricane Ike, there were a couple of years of terrible drought and we lost all those trees and everything. I know it affected y'all too, it's just the worst. And so the legislature, maybe it was 2013 or something or 15, got together and passed a statute that is doing what Pam's talking about. And what it did was it said, um, it was geared towards water conservation. So not necessarily native plants. So it said that HOAs, private uh, HOAs cannot per se just, it, I, I'm, tr I'm paraphrasing, I'm trying to remember y'all. Um, they can't just prohibit people from having rain barrels to collect water. They can't prohibit people from using xeriscaping, for example. So low water plants. And of course we know that a lot of our native plants are drought tolerant, right? So there's an argument that that fits under there. But what they can do is they can regulate. So where you put that water collection receptacle or the color of it, right? Or the size of it, they might be able to regulate. Likewise, where your garden bed goes and so on and so forth. So they can regulate it, but they can't outright prohibit it if what you're doing um, fits into these categories of things in certain size cities only, <laughs> um, if it fits into these categories that conserve water. So, and, and that is despite HOA um, rules and deed restrictions, which is unheard of. I was surprised, like normally they say, you can have this landscaping, but if your HOA private contract says you can't, then too bad. But they trumped it, which was surprising to me. So we know that these statutes can exist, Pam, it's just that they're not absolutes in our favor. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, the class that um, the subcommittee that I'm chairing with um, three other people from that side who are amazing that we're putting together on advocacy is going to talk about some of these legal structures that um, that you know control at the state and local level. So what things control what we do in our yards, including those private things like deed restrictions and so forth. And then how do we work with them? How do we work with our HOA to get them to change their mind, right? I think part of it too is being very careful when you start, Pam, reading those deed restrictions and HOA rules. And to the extent possible, like if they say your bed has to be this size, keep the bed that size, but if they don't regulate the plants that go in it, plant the heck out of those native plants. So do that or seek pre-approval for an exemption. And if you can't get by with that, or some HOA restrictions just are like, you have these seven plants to plant, and invariably, they're invasive, non-native garbage, right? So if you have that, then it's a question of advocacy, which we're all exhausted, but that's the way to do it. And it's really about changing the minds of your neighbors, too. Like, my yard looks very different from everyone else's. One of the reasons that no one, like I don't have deed restrictions or HOA restrictions that preclude it, but people could complain if they wanted to. Um, and they could, they could bother, you know, create a bother, <laughs> but they don't because I have signs that say I'm a certified wildlife habitat and so forth. I have a little flip thing with flyers that says, take a flyer, learn the story of St. Julian's Crossing. And it talks about the gardens and has resources. I do seed giveaways for free with, when we're outside COVID at the house. When the neighbors move in, we do welcome baskets because that's what neighbors do. But then we get to know them and then the kids come over and they watch butterflies hatch and they watch butterflies lay their eggs and they hold caterpillars. So it's all about building those relationships. That won't always convince an HOA board, <laughs> um, but those kinds of things are all ways of being ambassadors. And we hope to address some of those in that NLCP class. Thank you. Uh, Rachel um, from San Antonio, Sominski has put up some links that uh, right. um, everyone should take note of. I think we can save those and post them. So thank you. Yeah. Any other questions, anyone? Uh, Lauren, you had said something earlier about telling us why you named your garden, oh. what you did. Ooh. So we'd appreciate it if you could tell us that story. <laughs> sure, Nancy. So everyone says, why St. Julian's Crossing Wildlife Habitat? So it's actually a funny story, right? So when we have three certifications for our gardens, and one of them is a Monarch Way Station with Monarch Watch, which I highly recommend too. And you can take on a name when you certify it. And so I said to my, I, I'm Catholic. So I said to my husband, who is not Catholic, on a good day standing downwind, I said, I would love to name it after a saint. And, and I love St. Francis of Assisi, but everyone's garden is devoted to St. Francis of Assisi. I said, so I have to think of something. 
Five minutes later, he comes in, my non-Catholic husband, and he goes, how about St. Julian, the hospital? And I said, what? <laughs> Who's that? And he goes, he's the patron saint of travelers and innkeepers, and the monarchs are the travelers through the inn of our garden. <gasps> Wow. And I said two wow. things to him. I said, first off, you can watch all the football you want now. No problem. <laughs> and second, are you sure you're not Catholic? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's the story of our name. And uh, it just I, it just sort of united all those because ultimately I see the ecosystem as God's creation. I see it as you know, regardless of a person's spirituality or religion, I think we're all feeling connected, you know, that God has created this earth. And so we are stewards of this earth. And so that's one of the reasons I wanted it to have a spiritual name. It just happened to be in my faith tradition. Thank you for sharing that. I really like that story. <laughs> are there uh, any, any other, other questions? Okay, I am not seeing anything. I, I think you did such an amazing job covering oh, everything yeah. that we're all just left in awe. Well, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh -huh. um, I really appreciated what you said about the circle of life of things. And this summer that was uh, tested a little bit for me because we saw an anole lizard catch a dragonfly and another time with a big bee in its mouth. And I was like, oh, no, but, you know, it's all part of it. And they are beneficial predators. I saw a wasp fighting with a teeny little green caterpillar. We've seen just so many. There were aphids that attacked my coral honeysuckle, you know, first thing this spring. And I was like, oh, no, but I just left it. And a couple of weeks later, there were tons of lady beetle larvae all over it, just like you were saying. And so, you know, when I just stop that urge. Plus, you know, I'm a little bit more of a lazy gardener too. So that's, that's kind of how I started discovering these things because I just didn't get around to it yet. And then I started noticing. So, you know, sometimes it is our resolve is tested there and then we see, you know, what will happen. And I just, I really appreciated um, what you said in all your beautiful photos, because it really has been amazing um, seeing seeing everything that's even in a little suburban garden. So thank you. Oh, you're what is it? Is it Lana? Lana, like banana. Lana. <laughs> Lana. Thank you for that, Lana. I think you, you know, it's, it is a beautiful thing to watch that circle of life, is it not? And, and I think we have to kind of, it's hard to take ourselves out of it because we tend to think of, I think innately we think of good bug, bad bug, but there's really no bad bugs. There are or good bugs, there's just bugs. And, um, you know, in the wild, only about one out of every 100 butterfly eggs becomes an adult. But those caterpillars and adult butterflies that are eaten are eaten by things that do other things. Just like you said, Lana, they, it is a big circle of life. And so when we remove ourselves from it, it's actually been a blessing and a joy to see that interaction. And so I actually document those things and record them on iNaturalist and other citizen science projects. Um, I just have learned so much and it's so cool. So I, I and, and I, I'm just so inspired by God's creation when I see that. I, I feel the same way. And I really appreciate what you said about good bugs, bad bugs. I've had to learn that those are just human, you know, constructs that we apply those things but that's not the case and a lot of predators are indiscriminate predators so if we get rid of something because they ate something that we like then they're not going to be there to eat the things we also don't like i know exactly so, and uh this this summer i started a, an inat account and then uh, my husband did too even so he's he's being sucked into it by my uh <laughs> so well, I think if y'all want to see the Facebook educational community or our Instagram community or our website, which is just a portal to Facebook or our, my iNaturalist account, then you, I think those are on that handout that Nancy mentioned is on the website, on the webpage with the link to this presentation. And so you can, I think it's on the second or the last page of that. And you can find those things there. I'm glad that you mentioned that. Yes, your handouts will be available on the website. 
And the recording as well. Uh, yes. We have several people ask, and uh, Lauren has given us permission, I believe, to record this, which we did, and uh, put it out on our website. Uh, I'm sure it will take us a couple of days, but we will get it out there. Thank you very much. My um, pleasure. And if, if someone could send me the link to that when it's done, I'll share it on St. Julian's Crossing Wildlife Habitat. Ooh, excellent. Okay. All right. Um, shall I stop the recording? Yes, I believe so. Yeah. <laughs>